Good morning, Life Point Church. Thank you for joining with us today. Would you please stand as we worship our God this morning? Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. Give praise to the Lord. Beside Him there is no other.
was lost and all alone Your presence was where I found home You were there and you're here right now In every high and every low You never left me without hope You were good and you're good right now I've witnessed your faithfulness I've seen you breathe life within So I'll pour out my praise again You're worthy, God, you're worthy of all of it Your promises never fail I've got stories I'll live to tell So I'll pour out my praise again You're worthy, God, you're worthy of all of it the throne and chose the cross, laid down your life to rescue us, the Savior then, the Savior now. But even death was not the end, you conquered hell so I could live.
good to be in God's house this morning. You know, this next song we're about to sing, I, as I was picking the songs for this week, admittedly, I really wrestled with God about singing this next song because the song has been helping me with something that I've been struggling with for a while now. I've been struggling with severe depression for the past while, and I've kept it to myself. I haven't been honest with those that love me and it's caused hurt in my life and it was just this week that, fi that God finally gave me the courage to open up and instead of receiving condemnation like I thought I would I was not only received by God's love I was received by those that love me so I don't know what you're struggling with this morning it could be depression it could be anxiety it could be loneliness Maybe you don't even know why you're feeling down. No matter what is going on this morning, please know that God loves you and he's there with you right now. So let's just sing this song as a reminder for that.
thank you, God, that you are above depression. You are above anxiety. You are above hardship, Lord. That we know life can be really hard sometimes. But you are there with us. You're walking with us. Your word says, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. And we just thank you for that truth, Lord. So let us focus our eyes on you this morning as we grow closer. Let's focus on you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much for singing with us. Would you please greet your neighbor as we gather for this morning's Life Connection? Point. We're so glad you're joining us today, whether you're in person or watching online. Be sure to take a second to check out the cards that are sitting in the seat next to you. Whether you're new, want to take the next step in your faith, or get more involved serving here at LifePoint, or you have a prayer request to submit, those are a great way to get connected. If you want to keep up to date with all of the happenings that are going on here at LifePoint, you've got to download the Church Center app. The app is our central hub where you can find all the different events to register for, groups to join, public prayer lists, or even set up online giving. Now, as always, we want to say a big thank you to all of you who give regularly to support the work of ministry here at LifePoint. But if you're new joining us today, we don't want you to feel any obligation to give. This service is our gift to you, and we just hope you leave feeling challenged and encouraged. But for anyone who would like to give, there are several ways you can do so. There's boxes at the back of the auditorium. You can mail a check to the church. You can set up online giving through the app or the website, and you can even text to give. If your child is joining us in service today and they get a little restless, well, let you know we have a nursing mother's and crying child room available out in the lobby. There's audio and video in both of these rooms, so you don't have to miss any part of the service. Don't forget that today, after second service out in the parking lot, it's our all-church cookout. This is a great opportunity for us to spend some time together as a church family, so we really hope you join us out in the parking lot after the service. Now, up next, continuing our series, My Toxic Mind, is our lead pastor, Glenn Pfeiffer. So, let's dive in together. Good morning, Life Point Church. Great to see you today. Great to be together. And uh, so thankful for what God's doing at our church. Thankful for our team, for John and Greg stepping up to speak, and all the, our staff working hard behind the scenes. So many volunteers making things happen. Uh, God's working here, and I'm just so grateful and humbled by that. And uh, thankful for the opportunity we have to continue to grow. God is growing our church. And as you know, as was mentioned last week, mentioned a few weeks ago, we we're working towards a third service on September 22nd, and so I just want to say something about that, 11.30 service. Uh, pose a challenge to you. We'd love to have 75 to 100 of you uh, say, you know what, I could do this third service for three months. Uh, just get us through the startup of this, and that would be an immense help. Um, also, I'd love to ask you, every one of you, to attend the 11.30 service at least once this fall. Check it out and, and help us kind of get a, a momentum as we start this uh, new opportunity to serve others and create open space and open seats for, for other people. And uh, continue to invite people. A lot of people have told me the story of inviting friends and family and they're like, they don't do church. They're coming here, they're checking it out and they're like, you know what, maybe I, maybe I will come. And that's awesome, and we're very, again, humbled and grateful for that. So we want to create more room. We don't want to just stop the momentum that God has given us. And so on September 22nd, those are a couple challenges. And also invite somebody. We're going to have a new series into the fall. Uh, we have an election coming up. We have different dynamics into the fall. And um, I'm very excited about the message and the content that is coming together for that new series. And now, well, we're in this series currently, uh, My Toxic Mind. And over the last few weeks, we've been talking about different ways uh, that we struggle 
with our thought life and how we can overcome those things. And we started with this idea of our mind as a battleground, that there's a war being waged between our ears and our thought life that, that can create a lot of negativity and can really sideline us and sabotage our lives and our future. And, and this is something where the battle takes place between good thoughts or waging war against bad thoughts and negative thoughts are waging war against positive thoughts and ungodly thoughts are waging war against godly thoughts. And no one is exempt from this. This is a, something that affects every single one of us. That no matter how smart we are or how well-adjusted we are, no matter how spiritual we are, we are all gonna fight this battle in our thought life. And we have to wage this war carefully because if we're not careful, it can win out over us and ruin us and kind of sabotage our lives and our future. And so we started out by looking at an important passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I wanna revisit that, where Paul talks about this very same thing, that there is this, this toxin that brews in our culture that can undermine us spiritually and in every other way. And he writes about this when he says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Here Paul is talking about strongholds. These are thoughts and thought patterns that not only deny the truth about God, but are also a personal battle that we wage that can, again, undermine us with negativity that can affect us spiritually, relationally, socially, and in every other way. And Paul here challenges us to be aware of these strongholds because these are opportunities the enemy will use against us again, to sabotage us and to ruin us and to derail us in our journey with the Lord. And he tells us the way we get this done is by taking every thought captive to Christ. And there's a way we can do that, and we've talked about this, that we need to first identify the thoughts that are out there that we're being bombarded with all the time. That there's all kinds of ideologies and philosophies and ideas that, that are coming to us from, you know, Facebook reels and YouTube shorts and TikTok and social media and different forms of media and friends and family. All kinds of philosophies and ideas that are coming our way, some of which are really destructive. And we need to be very careful because if we're a little oblivious to it, these thoughts bombard us and we start owning them, we start embracing them, and we don't even know how they affect our lives. So we need to identify the messages that are coming in our, into our mind, and then we need to take the step of interrogating our thoughts, stopping and asking a question of the thought that wants to get implanted in our brain, asking ourselves, does this thought honor God? Does this thought honor God? Does this thought please God? And ask this question too. If I would embrace this thought, what is the natural extension of this thought? Like where does it take me? If I live out this thought and embrace it, what's the outcome going to be? The natural extension of this thought, will it help me become the best version of myself? or will it undermine me? It, what is the natural extension of this thought? Is it gonna make me more like Christ, or is it gonna make me far different than maybe I wanna be spiritually? We need to think about that. Is that going to lead to a better relationship, a better marriage? Uh, are we gonna be better able to handle the challenges of parenting if I take this thought, run with it, let it become implanted, and let it dominate my life? We need to interrogate our thoughts. And we need then to screen out the thoughts that don't align with God's word. And this is taking every thought captive. To align our thoughts with what God says, what he knows is best for us, and the future he intends to deliver. And this, of course, is a big time challenge. 
but it's something God calls us to be proactive about, to say no to the temptations that we face and the toxins that brew all around us. Other scriptures tell us the exact same thing. In Romans 12, 2, it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. There's a, there's a world pattern out there that's bombarding your brain all the time, that's bombarding us, that's telling us how to live with certain values and per, a certain purpose, and it's way out of a line with our wiring and what God made us to be. So it's easy to follow the pattern of this world. But don't conform to it, Paul says. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Conforming to his values, to his will, to his word, to his desire for our future. But here's the thing, let's be honest. This taking every thought captive for Christ is actually a very, very hard thing to do. This allowing God to transform our minds is incredibly difficult. And I, I realized that and I kind of was reminded of that battle that I personally face when this past week I attended a conference in Cincinnati with other pastors and other uh, church leaders. And that trip was brutal. I'm just gonna be honest with you. It was a big time test. And our circumstances can really test us. And I had planned to tell you about my trip out to Cincinnati for this conference. That I went to the Harrisburg Airport and I got on the plane. And then when I got on the plane, we taxied away from the gate and then nothing. Like n nothing happened. We, we stayed there and we stayed there a long time. And then the captain came on the intercom and said, we're gonna stay there longer. And then nothing still happened, and then the captain said, we're going back to the gate because we're out of gas. <laughs> so I'm like, this is just starting really poorly. Like, this is horrible situation. I was gonna tell you about that. I was gonna tell you also uh, about how I missed my flight by three minutes. My connecting flight, I can't go directly from Harrisburg to Cincinnati, I had to go to Charlotte. And so that didn't work out too well either. I missed my flight by three minutes. I went up to the desk and I said, listen, can I just get on the plane? I'll run out there. Can I just run out? And they're like, dude, you can't do that. I'm like, I would do that. I will do, you don't know me. And they're like, you can't do that. So I, I was gonna tell you about that. I was gonna tell you about the hotel situation. How when I got to my room, it smelled like smoke, and not just smoke, but like there had been a forest fire in it. <laughs> like there had been an actual forest fire in the room. I was looking for like charred logs. Like are they under the bed? Like where are the charred like tree stumps? Because it smelled horrible. I was gonna tell you about that and, and how somebody played ding dong ditch or whatever you call it by slamming my door at midnight. Two teenagers, I saw them through the peephole. <laughs> running away laughing hilariously, as they slammed my door, woke me up at midnight. I, I was gonna tell you about that and also how we had to evacuate the hotel <laughs> because somebody did something, I don't know, we never found out, but people are walking around like seriously, like they're, like they're walking around like this. It was like really early in the morning and uh, like virtually in their underwear. I was gonna, I would tell you about, and also my door stopped working so I couldn't get in when I was rushing to go somewhere. I was gonna tell you about all that, but here's the thing. All of that was nothing compared to my trip home. <laughs> so here I am, I just wanna go from Cincinnati to Harrisburg, but I have a connecting flight. I have to fly into Charlotte, okay? So I, that goes pretty well. I get there uh, a little bit early. I call an Uber. I met a guy named Ishmael, super nice guy from Turkey. Talked to him for a while. I got to hear his story. Enjoyed that a lot. I got to the airport. I went through security. For whatever reason, when I go through security, I get extra layers of security and screening. I think I look shady. There's something wrong with me. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I got through. I breezed right through kind of the, the safety screening. And I got to uh, the uh, gate, and the plane was there. And that's a good thing. And 
I was looking at this saying, this might be okay. This might be working out until I looked at the board and realized that something was wrong, that the gate I'm scheduled to leave from is actually a flight going to Bangor, Maine. And they're scheduled to leave seven minutes prior to my flight leaving. And I'm like, how are you going to board two flights from the same gate at the same time? And they never changed my gate. They said, that's where you're leaving. And I'm like, how does that happen? And no one could tell me. Until about 30 minutes before boarding, they said, your flight is delayed. Okay, I can handle that. They delayed it to 2.30, supposed to leave at 12.30. And then I'm doing work, pulling out my laptop, doing some work, trying to get some things done. I got a lot to do. And then we're 30 minutes before boarding, and then they said it again. Your flight is delayed to 4.30. I'm like, okay, I'm going to lose my mind here. <laughs> okay. But patiently waited. We're going to leave at 6.30 now. 30 minutes before boarding, they said, we're actually delaying till 8.00. Uh, another delay. At that point, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about all this, and I don't want to lose my mind. I'm trying, I'm trying to maintain my composure, so I'm thinking to myself, as I write this message for today, take every thought captive for Christ. Take every thought captive for Christ. Take every thought captive for Christ. I'm thinking, come on, you got to do this. You got to do this. At the same time, I'm texting our staff, I'm texting Denise, but I'm texting our staff as well because I just need moral support because I'm going to lose it any minute. I'm like, I'm really at my wit's end with all this. And so we're texting back and forth. And I said, listen, despite everything that's happening, I want you to know that I'm still putting on my happy face. Okay, and I texted them a picture of my happy face. <laughs> Now, now, I want you to know, you know that I'm from New Jersey. That seriously is a happy face. <laughs> Grew up there, so that's how ha I'm happy. I'm really happy. I'm joy-filled in this moment. Uh, but here, in the midst of all of it, then 30 minutes before boarding the next flight at 8 o'clock, they canceled the whole thing. When they did that, all of a sudden, Hundreds of people stood up in the airport and they got in a line. Hundreds of people, a very long line, like with multiple people, like five, six, you know, at a, like thick with people, hundreds of people, to talk to four agents <laughs> to rebook their flight. Okay, my head's gonna explode. I didn't get, take my blood pressure, but I think it was, it was I had issues. So I met a couple people at the gate who were also part of this trip. And one was a woman named Patty, who is a children's pastor in Harrisburg, fantastic person. She was there. And then I met a guy named Nevin, who was a delegate at this conference. He was from Dillsburg, 87 years old, and he's in a wheelchair. You know, he's trying to navigate all this. And I'm checking my app because I figure that if I wait three hours to talk to one of these agents, they're going to bring up the same thing I see on my app. These are the flights. The next flight that I could book was 10 o'clock the next morning, so I got to get a hotel, 10 o'clock the next morning to Boston. And then at 10 at night, they would fly me back to Harrisburg. I'm like, no. And there were no other flights. The lady next to me is trying to... She booked, she said to me, I said, what are, you, what are you gonna do here? And she goes, I booked that flight. And then she goes, but they didn't give me a boarding pass. And I'm like, hmm, you ain't getting one. That, and she never got one. So finally, I'm, I'm just done, I'm done. So I said, I said to Patty and Nevin, I said, here's the deal, I'm leaving. I'm leaving the airport right now. I'm going to go rent a car. And it was 9 o'clock at night. And I was like, I was tired. I was super tired. I'm, I'm driving home right now. I'm leaving. I'm not going to wait three hours for them to tell me that I got to go to Boston. Which, by the way, had that happened, had they canceled that flight, you know what happened with the IT, worldwide IT break out, uh, breakdown the next day? That, I could... 
Greg Deardorff said on Tuesday, tongue in cheek, I hope you get back by, two, by, by Sunday. And I'm like, Greg, that's hilarious. <laughs> that would have happened. That would have happened, I think, because then you kind of bridge that into this IT situation. I'd still be in Boston. I don't know. I'd be Nova Scotia. I don't know where I would be. <laughs> but anyway, all this is happening and finally decided that we're gonna rent this car. And so I'm pushing Nevin through the airport. He's in a wheelchair. Um, and we're trying to get there quick. And we're like, I think everybody's gonna try to get a car. Make a long story short, we went to Hertz. We got a car. They had one car. It was a, a Malibu. I'm like, I love Malibus. Let's drive this baby. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm tired, but I can do this. I can do this because I got great company. And, and during this trip, I was like, tell me, tell me your life story. And they're like, <laughs> Nevin was a talker. He had great stories. I'm like, I said, no, I need more detail. <laughs> uh, like a lot, give me everything you got. And he was, he got all kinds. I got a great story from him and Patty too. And so company helped me, but so did caffeine. Caffeine was huge. So I bought all this caffeine. I bought a gigantic Starbucks double shot thing. And it was loaded with calories. And I don't usually like that, but I didn't care. I just chugged the whole thing. I got the whole thing. I'm buying big iced teas, like black tea. I bought uh, my son, uh, Stephen, he likes uh, Red Bull. So I went hard at the Red Bull. Sugar, sugar free. So I already had all my calories from the Starbucks thing. I went hard at the Red Bull and I'm chugging this and I got a soda. And so I'm driving. We finally got out. I'm, I'm driving. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, man, I am. Wild. If we had a traffic jam, I would get out and start running. It was real. I was so wired. But I tell you, I'm so thankful that with the storytelling and caffeine that we made it because it was an eight-hour trip. Leaving at nine at night, that's not my thing. I, don't, I, I get tired. I was already tired, but I thank God by his grace. We stayed on the road, got home safely just after three. It was about seven, just over seven hours. And in the midst of that, I'm thankful that I maintain my composure because it's so easy in the midst of difficult circumstances to lose it. And we feel justified at incompetency or we feel justified that things weren't handled the right way and that we have a right to respond to the way we do, that toxic thoughts absolutely knock on our brain. They want to make an appearance. And if we allow that to happen, we can say the wrong things. I was, I'm 100% capable of it. Say the wrong things. We can think the wrong things that lead to the wrong actions, and then we find ourselves out of alignment with what God really wants us to be. And so this is a reminder that our circumstances are fertile ground for toxic thoughts. Now, typically what I would do here is I would launch into the passage, because there's more I want to say here. But... I also want to comment on last Saturday, uh, what happened and affected our country, that I was coming out of a, a um, session when John Engel, Pastor John, texted me and said that uh, Donald Trump had been shot. And I was like, what? That's nuts. Like, that is insane. And so I did, hadn't been on the news. I hadn't seen anything or heard anything. That's the first time it came up. I got to the internet as fast as I could to try to get a sense of what was uh, happening and uh, basically found out that he had been shot and that thankfully uh, he was okay. And uh, after something like that, you wonder how the world is gonna respond. And would it deepen the divide in our country would people polarize more? Would there kind of be people re trying to retaliate for this or that? You worry about that. And I saw some responses on social media that basically were toxic. I saw people minimizing what happened, excusing what happened, mocking what happened, lamenting that the guy, the kid, 
was a bad shot. And you can expect political extremism in a situation like this. But you also hope that there might be an adult in the room, that there might be somebody that steps up and says, you know, this is bad for all of us. This is bad for our country. This is bad for our world. It's not just bad for Donald Trump or his family. It's bad for all of us as Americans. Will anybody offer a sane response? Fortunately, our president, Biden, denounced it, uh, talking to the nation about lowering the temperature in our politics to remember that while we may disagree, we are not enemies. Now, some may doubt the, the sincerity of, of those words, but if you take them at face value, he's right. We need to lower the temperature in our conversations about our politics. Barack Obama said the exact same thing. He said there's no place for political violence. He's glad that Trump wasn't seriously hurt. We need to use this moment to recommit ourselves to civility and respect in our politics that they wished him a quick recovery. Again, I know that some people will point to the other political party uh, that they don't like and give examples of how they are singularly responsible for incivility in the culture. But here's the problem, that when there's hatred and animosity and violence, it only breeds what? More hatred and anger and violence. There's no answer or solution to this. And so this is a horrendous thing. And in a political season, we need to be aware of how these things can make us more toxic, how it can affect our brain and our thought life. And so I think for us, this is a what the dyna dynamics of our church is actually a super healthy thing. I'm actually really glad that many of you are Democrats at our church. Huge contingent are Democrats here. I'm also glad that many of you, big contingent, are Republicans because it gives us an opportunity to say that my relationship with you is more important than my political ideas or ideology. That's a really important thing to recognize that, that ultimately, um, every politician and political platform, every politician, they're going to fail us, ultimately. And that we have a responsibility to be committed to something bigger, to kingdom purposes, to do his work in the world and recognize that God is the one who will never let us down and we should be all in with him. But I say all this because I want us to re recognize that in a chaotic world, we're going to be bombarded by toxic thoughts. And we're going to have to deal with them in healthy ways. So whether it's our own personal circumstances or the chaos of our world, or as we said a couple weeks ago, our own negative playlist where we beat ourselves down with negativity and untrue things, we're not very kind to ourselves sometimes, this becomes a toxic brew that can ruin us. And that's why it's important for us to ask a question of ourselves. If you're going through hard circumstances or if you're struggling with our culture and what's happening in our world or if you're struggling with your own insecurities, you know, where do your thoughts in the midst of all this tend to drift? What about you? Where do you th your thoughts tend to drift? Do you struggle with angry or bitter thoughts because of frustrations or disappointments in your life? Do you, struggle, do, you, do you struggle with worry? Do you worry about a million things? Like, are you an expert in worst case scenarios? It's like you run them all. You got them, you got them nailed down. You know every bad thing that can possibly happen to you, but it's robbing you of your peace and your joy. Do you struggle with insecurities or feelings of inadequacy, as John spoke about um, a couple weeks ago, shame, guilt and shame that ruin us. Do you say negative things about yourself? I will, I'll always be broke, I'll never be he healthy, I'm never gonna have friends, I'll never amount to anything. Do you even tell yourself negative things about God? God doesn't care, God doesn't even see. I don't know if God even exists. God doesn't even answer prayer. All those things are untrue. But we can tell ourselves that because of our own negative playlist. 
And this is where the Apostle Paul is a huge help to us. Because here's the deal. Not only does he tell us these things prior about strongholds, that we're going to deal with strongholds, he not only tells us to take every thought captive for Christ, he not only tells us that we need to not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. He doesn't just tell us those things. Yeah, you all do that. You all do that. But me, I don't know. I might do it. I might not. No, he doesn't just tell us to do these things. He demonstrates it in his own life. And that's where he goes in this book of Philippians. I'm gonna look at that because he is going through something far more difficult, far more challenging than any travel difficulties you could ever imagine. And he writes about that in Philippians chapter one, verse 12. It says, now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me what has happened to me? Paul, what? What has happened to Paul? What has happened to you? He doesn't get into details here, but I want to tell you the backstory because what has happened to him is absolutely brutal. You see, when Paul crossed the line of faith and accepted Jesus into his life, He's on the road to Damascus. He's persecuting the church. He doesn't believe in Jesus. He hates Christians. He's gonna to try to kill them. He meets the resurrected Christ on the Damascus road and he realizes he was wrong. That, and, and he embraces faith and not only embraces it, he goes, I'm all in. I'm gonna spend the rest of my life telling everyone that Jesus is the resurrected son of God and savior of the world. But in the midst of that commitment, there were a lot of people who didn't like that. And so he was persecuted for his faith in Jesus. He was rejected by many people. He dealt with personal rejection. You know, like dirty looks and stuff. Like, you know how somebody gives us a dirty look? We're like, oh yeah, well then I'm gonna give you a dirty look. It's like, and, and we go home and we, talk, we tell a story about the dirty look we got. Well, he's getting them all the time. He was dealing with personal rejection. He was dealing with persecution. There were people then who were coming along who were questioning the legitimacy of his ministry. They're like, Paul, you're too humble. You're not powerful enough. You're like a small dude. Like, you're not really an apostle. We want somebody powerful. We want somebody who takes over and who demands stuff from us and is commanding with their presence and their words. And Paul's not that. So they're like, we don't even think you're legit. And they despised him. Other people went exactly the opposite and said, Paul has so much influence and authority. Here's the deal. I want that. I want his influence. I want his power. It's like some pastor of some church looking at another pastor at another church saying, I want to be there because you have more prestige or whatever. Well, these people weren't in for, in serving God, into serving God for the advancement of the kingdom. They were into serving God for the advancement of themselves. They made this about themselves. So Paul now is somebody who's a rival. They're competing with him, and they want to undermine him and sabotage his ministry. But worst of all, as background to this passage, they're trying to kill him. They want this guy dead. The Jewish religious leaders hated Paul's message, and they hated his influence, and that he was starting churches, and that many people were responding to this message of life and hope in Jesus. And so they lied about him and made false accusations to the Roman government, saying that Paul was a threat to Rome. And Rome knew that was false, but it still was all politics. And so Paul was arrested. Paul was put in prison. Paul here in this passage in Philippians is under house arrest. He's chained to a guard 24 hours a day. And now his ministry is being restricted. He can't visit the churches anymore. He can't face his, his detractors uh, directly because he can't get out. He's stuck. His ministry is being hampered and he's not able to resource the churches or visit with them. And he is also facing the very good, very real likelihood that if this, he's under trial with Rome, that they could find him guilty. 
He could be executed. He faces capital punishment. So this is the backstory. He's going through a brutal stretch. Any one of those things would be enough for you or me to say, boy, that's just this horrible life I've got. Just take one. Add them all up. That's Paul's story. So the question really is, you know, how would you respond to that kind of situation where something is unjust? Maybe you face something that's just not fair. You're like, that, I, I really got screwed over by that. This is totally wrong and unfair. How, how do you respond when people badmouth you? They say things about you that are untrue and other people believe it. They're like, yeah, you're right, so-and-so is this or that. How do you respond when people badmouth you? How do you respond to circumstances that don't make sense to you? Like you would send God a very different plot line for how your life would play out and it doesn't make sense. How do you respond when people are undermining you? Well, we have to ask that of Paul. Here we have lots of options. Paul could have said, now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has made me into a furious, bitter, angry, resentful man. He could have said that. All these things, have you been to prison? Have you had a death threat made against you? Have you been somebody d dealt with this kind of injustice? How would you respond? I mean, would you be resentful? He could have said that. He could have said, you know, brothers, what has happened to me has forced me to live with a chip on my shoulder. I got this chip on my shoulder, so I'm going to spend the rest of my life with proving behavior. I'm going to prove you all wrong. I'm going to prove my mom wrong. I'm going to prove my family wrong. I'm going to prove my friends wrong because they didn't, they didn't believe in me. So I'm going to live this way, trying to prove everyone wrong. I'll show you. That's going to be my permanent attitude. Let me show you. Just a bitterness that would ruin him. He could have said, you know, brothers, what has happened to me has racked my life with fear. I'm so afraid I don't want to die. Any minute, guards could come in and take me away and just chop my head off. And he eventually did die, but it could happen at any moment. And I'm racked by fear, anxiety, despair, and depression. He could have said, you know, all that I've gone through, brothers, it's happened to me. And now, you know me. I'm a man seeking revenge. I'm bitter, and I'm all about payback. You're going to pay for what you did to me. These are very real responses. And these are things that he could have chosen because there were all these toxic thoughts coming his way. He's a human being like you and me. We're susceptible to these things when it's unfair or wrong. And it's like, I'm not tolerating this. And it creates emotions and anxieties and reactions that can ruin us. And Paul had every option here. But here's what's amazing. That Paul still, despite his circumstances, did what he told us to do. He took every thought captive. And this amazing man lived it out because he didn't say any of these things. Instead, he responded to his brutal circumstances this way. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What? What? As a result of all I'm going through, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. My faith has risen to the top because they're like, why are you so different? Why aren't you reacting like everybody else in the world? What's happening? Why, what's unique about you? Why are you so countercultural? And he points to Jesus and said, that's why. And so the message about Jesus is becoming known everywhere. Because of my chains, most of my brothers in the Lord have, be, have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. So instead of cowering to his circumstances, instead of going carnal, losing his mind, letting the toxins dictate his life and his attitude and his future, he maintains his composure and focus on Christ. And other brothers are like, 
wait a minute, this dude is going through something way worse than me. You know what? I'm all in too. I'm not going to play games with this. He knows the resurrected Christ, and so do I, and I'm not going to compromise. Whatever, you may say this, you may pressure me. I don't care what other people say. I don't care what my friends say. I don't care what the religious leaders say. I'm all in for serving Jesus. It's his voice that's going to guide my steps. And the brothers and sisters, the church was encouraged. They became fearless. He says it's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of their own selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. The only thing they want to do is make me more miserable. They know I'm going through a horrible time. I got this wound that I'm dealing with, so they're going to pour salt on it. They want to make my life worse. They want to kick me when I'm down. And then Paul says this, what does it matter? It doesn't even matter what other people say. It doesn't ultimately matter what other people do. The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I, what? Rejoice. Yes, I will continue. Despite it all, I'm going to continue to rejoice. Yes, my life is hard, but God is bringing me through this hardship. Uh, his name is being exalted by my response to that hardship. Good will prevail. So here's what I'm going to do I'm going to win. God's word is going to prevail. Good will prevail, so I will, despite it all, find joy. Despite it all, I will rejoice. You see, Paul knew something. He knew that God was bigger than his circumstances. Bigger than his circumstances. He, he knew that God was with him in the midst of his circumstances. And he also know that, knew that God had a plan to use him to spring, spread light and hope and bring salvation to the world by his unique countercultural response to his circumstances. And so he was the guy who was identifying the thoughts that wanted to derail him, who interrogated those thoughts and aligned those thoughts so that every thought was taken captive for Christ. So what about you today? How are you handling a struggle in your own life? Maybe you've been betrayed. Maybe a dream has just been dashed. Maybe you're suffering through something. Life is disappointing. Someone has let you down. Maybe God seems a million miles away. How are you responding in the midst of those things? Are you identifying those thoughts? Are you interrogating them, are you aligning them with what God wants you to be and what he says about you and your future? What is important for us today is we cannot allow negative thoughts to own us. Don't let negative thoughts own you. They want to own you. They want to control you. They want to take over your life. But the good news in all of this is that we can resist this toxic brew by remembering that in our circumstances, that God is bigger than anything we face, that he's with you in your struggles, and that God will use you, if you allow him, to, to change the world by your unique countercultural counter response to suffering. Let God use you interrogate those thoughts and let him move in your mind and bring you to a place of health and wholeness because he's with you in all things. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, for the life of Paul and how he's not just preaching, telling us to do a bunch of stuff that seems like really hard 
maybe sometimes impossible. But God, he's living it out and we're seeing the value and impact of that. And that, Lord, whatever we face, whether it's canceled flights, illness, disappointments, really difficult relationships, God, we can bring them to you. And we can think your thoughts in those circumstances. We can align ourselves with what you want us to be and how you want us to respond. And you can bring us to a better place than we ever imagined. So God, guide us today. Help our thoughts to be pleasant and positive and honoring to you. And we'll give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Glenn, for that message. You know, as he was talking, I started thinking about my own life and how <clears throat> when I go through hardships, my natural reaction is to shut everyone out, to not want to engage with anyone and to say, to even to God, to say, God, leave me alone. I want to sit here in my misery. That's my natural state. But God called me to be more. God called me to do more. He said, Jimmy, I want to be a part of when you're going through a hard time. And that was so hard for me to understand for a very long time. How could God, the creator of joy, just want to be a part of that? But it's because he loves us. It's because we are his children. And he does what any loving father would do. He would pick his child up and he would hold them until they're ready to stand on their own again. So with that being said, I'm gonna invite you to stand with us as we sing this last song and just this song be a reminder of the love God has for us even when we are going through the hardest times. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful to
much for being with us this morning. Life Point, God loves you. Remember that as you go about your day, your week. Peace be with you. We'll see you next week. <laughs>